as a response to glaciation seas rising and the threat of extinction, Tustin Cave remembers acts of violence so grave that silence has prevailed for 2,000 years. Humans have been visiting the cave on the Isle of Skye from the Mesolithic period through the Iron Age to the present day. Eco-catastrophe has led to climate change and disease for millennia, disrupting patterns of human and animal behaviour. Global warming is reshuffling species around the planet, meaning that disease-causing microorganisms create new transmission pathways. The lethal respiratory virus SARS-CoV-2 has impacted human ecology dramatically. In the UK, femicide doubled during the first lockdown. In the Iron Age, pneumonic plague came from Europe and may have been responsible for the demise of 90% of the preceding population. Let us agree that this is COVID time. A child has seen the bruising painted across her mother's breast with all the colours of the rainbow. She is filled with wonder and not a little apprehension. She doesn't understand. She hunkers down inside the garage, examining the petrol stain left by the man's car. Somehow rainbow fragments have fallen to earth. This is the first map the child ever saw. It is only after they are dead that the child learns of their explorations in the other world. The understairs cupboard where her mother sits on the kitchen stool in complete darkness after everyone has gone to work or school. The only witness is a large black Bakelite telephone on the hall table, but the telephone is silent and speaks only in code, electroacoustic signalling, I am a sender, I transmit. A mysterious recollection of Joseph Boy's earth telephone and harbinger for the missive which comes later in my text. The characters in the text are Bridget and her Iron Age counterparts, Breacha, and her unborn child. Brig, the other child, had Neolithic ancestry. It is known that Breacha's ancestors came from Scandinavia. What we don't know is whether she or her ancestors brought plague to Skye, but it is a possibility. Skye is the place that links the three humans. They share mitochondrial DNA mutations, H7, L3, N and R. Each of us carries a map of our migration pathways within our DNA and we can map these haplotypes onto a migration pattern out of Africa. We carry these markers, these ghosts in our even deeper history. Bridget is here and she has nothing to say. She looks back to a past she knows nothing about and forwards to a future she knows only too well. She is born 2,000 years old and she is not yet 20. It is now and it is then. Bridget is destined to follow an infinite loop of recursive encounter. She is a child of sea and high places where women are mountains and mountains are men. Between the Coolin and Kilbride, Loch Slapin stretches out its finger towards Taciturn Cave, pointing. Silence is a phantom of language and demands she speaks the unutterable. Bridget is pregnant. You have nothing to fear and everything to fear, for mountains are capable of the utmost treachery. You know it is summer on the sky when the rain gets warmer. A group stands on the threshold, the point where the mountain stream Alt Nam Sridasham disappears from view. There is hierarchy to the entrance and afterwards speleological performance. The director of excavation and guide, Martin Wildgoose, goes first and shows Bridget where to place her feet on the slippery rocks. He recalls the horror he felt when first he encountered the pitch black cave, but Bridget is unafraid, for she has been schooled in the dark arts. Margaret Cliff descends last frightened by the sound of rushing, gushing water from below. She is terrified the water will rise following recent torrential rain. They pass through a curtain of white water that flows into the underground stream. They bend their legs and straighten 
mapping the undulation of the current, bobbing and curtsying each time Bridget sits down. Sharp shards of quartz rip her trousers, while subversive river water tugs at her feet. Bridget, wild goose and cliff snuff their lights and stand in silence in the pitch black. John Cage believed he heard his own heartbeat in an anechoic chamber. Cage sounds lead to cage silences. When speaking stops, hearing can begin almost for the first time. Music starts, a white froth gurgle and spill, a slick slippery incantation, a prehistoric synchronisation of air moving water through stone. A sound breaks in underneath the cords of running water, a thrumming backbeat, something hard and sharp, like stone resounding on stone, the audible pulse of the cave. Sounds appear to move around while the source remains still. Footsteps recede and come closer. Call and response emerge from the cave itself. Stone walls shake and the listeners feel themselves resonating. They are unable to speak, but hear disembodied voices. When it comes, the blue comes out of the blue. No warning, head down, a battering ram straight into her stomach. Bull roaring is answered by an inhuman cry coming not from her, but from the deep, dark, visceral centre of things. The bang echoes round the arc of cliffs and miles underground. The sky shrinks to a pinprick of bright light as she is propelled backwards. No one hears a thing, nothing is said. The world shakes and shivers, but no one sees a thing. As a gun recoils, the cool and draw back in guilt and shame. The thunder unleashed is answered by the bass notes of the ocean, quietly breathing out and breathing in. Stones ring on stone louder and louder with bell-like tones and gong-like resonances as humans and stone become a lithophone. After the violence comes the final act of closure. Rocks fall and reach her long before and forever thereafter is weighed down by skirtfuls of stones. The whole burial assemblage is entombed under tons of rubble and trash, thus erasing the site and its importance to memory, though traces exist in place names like St Bride's nearby. John Cage asks what happens when the telephone rings. Before contemporary conversation breaks in, before people, places and the things in between are organised into enclosures of order and the taxonomy of archaeology, powerful emotions are stirred in the audience by the recognition of a shared archaeoacoustic topography. A more than human awe is replaced by anger, sorrow and disgust. Thing power can be restored, but only if Taciturn Cave accepts a sacrificial gift. In the chaos that reigns, Bridget enters the sheep skull telephone on a stone shelf within the cave. Motionless on the hall table and in its glass vitrine, Joseph Boyce Earth telephone is a ghostly precedent for the museological assemblage. The Bakelite telephone and the clump of earth are not connected by the telephone cord. Not only can Boyce earthly idea be constructed as a warning that the link between humans and the earth can be broken, but the missive can only be received by telegraphic transfer. The sheep skull telephone is silent but potent with an inexpressible sound. Katerina Dulias and Stephen Birch state that the human remains are consistent with blunt force trauma. Ian Armit contends the Iron Age burial is a deviant one, even a sacrifice. The finding of a burnt lyre bridge in the hearth space puts the idea of music into the cave and lyre music may have accompanied Breacher to her grave. 
She may have been the musician. The act of burning might imply that the liar was sacrificed too. Martha Thema Penn and Leonardo Garcia Sanjan argue that gender inequalities emerged in the Iron Age, theorising an increasing domination of men over women. It is speculation to suggest the murder signifies a shift in the balance of power at Taciturn Cave. However, it is certain Breach and the Child Brig knew their killers. In our parallel world of climate emergency and SARS-CoV-2, Kumzi Olambo and Kuka describes violence against women and girls as the shadow pandemic. Globally, 243 million women and girls have been subjected to sexual and physical violence by an intimate partner in the previous 12 months. Christian Bock predicts the world will run out of human and animal species to sacrifice to our own anger deities, capitalist expenditure and expansion. It is in the spaces between human connection and disconnection from the land that trauma occurs and is visualised by the musicality of cave water in Taciturn Cave. What is clear is that we are all implicated in a collective act of primal witness provoked into existence by a shared experience of harm. After the Anthropocene, there are no humans present. The cave with its instruments plays itself and sings in the darkness a more anguished music of the spheres. Gwelesidil, o bentir y doin, abeth yn golcerth y disgynion. Gwelesoed cenefyn a drefredegyn, o hwyn naethon rhy golesyn. Gwelis i wir tilihawr gan wawr y doin. A phen donol frec, brain y cnoin. 